Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good afternoon. I hope you're all well fed. I'm pleased to see you all. Hope GDC is going well. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, my name is Josh Ostrander, and I'm here to speak to you today about building and operating live games with Unity Gaming Services, or UGS. So a little bit about me first. Uh, you'll find a profile picture here that has me in a sort of ill-advised Hawaiian detective phase. Um, I have a lot of experience in the gaming industry. I'm a director of product at UGS Platform. Um, and before that, I was at Game Developers for most of my career. Ubisoft, PopCap, Blue Mobile, a bunch of small studios as well. Um, in that time in the games industry, I worked on games of all scales and types. AAA, budget, mobile, console, RPGs, action, shooters, platformers, racers, yachting simulators even. Uh, and in that time, I've done nearly every conceivable role from shipping game masters from a warehouse to uh, retail, to production management, to systems design, to executive leadership even. Now, I've had the fortune of working on a lot of successful games, but I've also been on the business end of games that uh, were at core good experiences, but struggled to, to succeed because of poor understanding, broken builds, incorrect insights, bad net code, all related to tools and services outside of the game experience that you just expect to work, but they, for some reason, don't. So that's why I'm at Unity. I don't want that scenario to be your reality, and there's a lot UGS can do to help with that. So what are we gonna talk about today? UGS is relatively new to the gaming market. We hit our general availability milestone last July. We'll talk about what UGS is, our offering, and the principles that drive our development. The majority of our time will be spent on use cases and demos, pragmatic ones, some technical, some showcases that illustrate how UGS focuses on solving real problems unique to the professional game developer. Most of the use cases I'm about to share with you have more in-depth sessions at this conference, so I'll tell you a bit about how to learn more about them at the end of the session. So, what is Unity Gaming Services? Here's the tagline. Unity Gaming Services solves the developer challenges of building live games in a single modular platform. It includes multiplayer services, game operations, user acquisition, and monetization, and boy does it ever. We have offerings across the entire game lifecycle. Building your foundation of your game with account services, multiplayer services, backend configuration and management services, DevOps capabilities, through to the engagement of your players, analytics tools, player engagement tools, communication tools, uh, crash and reporting and monitoring tools. And we also have the offerings around growing your game, your monetization products, IAP, advertising, user acquisition, things that will help you take your player base and grow it to a more healthy place so your business can succeed. One of the common questions I get in the role that I have is, why is Unity in the services business? You've seen the mission and the huge list of products, so you know we're committed, but there is a set of guiding principles behind what we do that focuses on the challenges of the professional developer. Firstly, we're engine agnostic. We want you to make whatever kind of game you want, on whatever engine, for whatever platform, whatever genre. We just want you to know that we'll support it. We're an extensible offering. That means that if you want, you can use our packages, our SDKs, but you could also use our API so you can work with your own tools if you like. We want what's best for your most efficient workflows. It's important to us that we have a cohesive offering. Customers shouldn't have wildly different experiences from Unity service to Unity service, so we strive for consistency of developer experience in this area. That means consistent patterns for our UI UX, for our APIs, for our schemas, our identifiers, and our configurations. Lastly, but certainly not leastly, is unique insights. One of the advantages of spinning up such a comprehensive offering is the ability to generate analytics data from all of those offerings, which will give you unique insights from across the game lifecycle that help you make the right decisions to build the best player experience for your users. So we've talked about UGS, what it is, what we have to offer. Now onto the good stuff, the use cases. So we're gonna cover use cases from some of our highest impact deliveries in the past year. I'm gonna show you how to host and run a Battle Royale game with our game server hosting product. I'm gonna show you how to authenticate and manage players with our UGS player account services. We have a two-part technical area around deployments, both automating deployments and deploying from the editor using the UGS CLI and the deployment package. And then we'll cover live ops at the end with a, with a topic of operating live events with Unity player engagement. So let's get started. So on to the first use case, setting up and running a Battle Royale game with game server hosting. We're gonna walk through how to set up, host, and run a Battle Royale game with game server hosting, our self-serve hosting offering. We'll walk through the flow and deploy the configuration in a complete Battle Royale sample. We're here on the Unity dashboard to start. 
In this case, we assume you have a rocking game already with netcode implemented, have compiled and ex executable to test, and are now ready to configure and host your Battle Royale title. It starts with uploading a build. This can be done in the user interface, as you can see here, via an API, or through a container image, which allows you to ship any runtime dependencies you may have or libraries your game may need to run. You can upload as many builds, whatever variables you may want to test, as you want. You can see some examples on screen here. We have a couple of builds separated between a container image and a preloaded sample. So after that, you need to configure your build. Configuring a build defines how your server should run, what launch parameters are needed, what arguments need to be made, the executable name itself, and the amount of resources required for the server to run. These parameters are important for both managing costs for your servers and to ensure the efficient placement of your servers on the available hardware capacity. So after you've got your build configured and it's all set up, you have to define your fleets. What's a fleet, you may ask. If you don't know much about servers, a fleet defines where your servers are located. You can assign a region, define a minimum maximum number of servers needed, what resources are required to run them. This provides you the flexibility of meeting your player volume with adequate servers when you need it while also being able to control your costs. So now that we've got all of our servers set up, we head to our servers tab, to, which allows you to evaluate what fleets you have running. In this case, we see two separate servers running in a dev environment fleet, separated between a standalone and matchmaker configuration. Speaking of matchmaker, now that we've looked at our servers, it's time to connect our players with UGS matchmaker. The matchmaker orients around two concepts, queues and pools. Queues are used to group players together by game mode, for example. In this case, we've created a battle royale sample. In a queue, you define how many players you want per matchmaking ticket and how many pools there will be in the queue. A matchmaking ticket represents a player or game client's intent to find a match. So now that we've all got that nicely configured, it's time for us to set some rules in our pools. A pool defines the logic for matching your players and what servers they end up playing on. A queue can have many pools, which can be configured, by, can be configured to dynamically filter and group players together using Matchmaker's powerful rule builder. Now this is a really cool tool. It has both standard and custom rules that you can implement. What region players play in, team counts, player counts, even custom rules with logical operators using data we have in the ticket. So for example, you could send beta testers to test in different sets of servers. It also supports backfill, which matches players into ongoing matches. For those of you that play on multiplayer, when people quit matches, it's a better experience if you can fill those slots quickly. And it also has the convenient outcome of letting you manage your server resources. So we've set backfill to true to enable that. And it looks like at this point, we're ready to launch our game at world scale. So we'll hop out of our rule builder and wait for our game to load. So here's what you're seeing on the screen right now. This is BR200. It's a 200 Battle Royale game developed by Exit Games. It's fully in integrated with Unity Gaming Services. It launches with the game server hosting and matchmaker SDKs built in. It's currently available on the Unity Asset Store. The server configuration and matchmaker rules we just set up in this demo are in place and ready to go. So we're gonna click play and try to find ourselves a match. We hit quick play to start the match, and now game server hosting and matchmaker are working behind the scenes to find a server, ticket, and match for us right now. Let's see if it works. Oh, well there we go. So there we are, up and running, showing that a AAA scale, fully fledged battle royale can be hosted and run with Unity Gaming Services. If you have further questions about this demo or this capability, you can find me in the sidebar after uh, this session. So moving along, staying in the player lens, away from connecting players, and now to helping and helping them with Unity Player Account Services. Anyone that's operated a live game before knows that managing your players is a key part of the experience. Getting them authenticated, identifying them, and the complexities of supporting them once they are happily, or in some cases, unhappily playing. This is where UGS Player Account Services comes in. So we're about to look at a, at a technical demo that's split into two parts. One that's from the player's perspective, where a player creates an account, uploads their profile info, and completes a mission with a reward. They're going to, then we're gonna switch to the developer point of view or the customer service point of view, and you can find out how you can view player data in the Unity dashboard and use it to help manage your players with common actions like giving them awards, banning them, or deleting their data. So let's get started. Starting with the player view in this simple wireframe that's meant to simulate a game, to start, the player isn't signed in and is looking to create an account. This is where UGS authentication comes in. Developers can use UGS auth to authenticate players in a number of ways. 
They can do it anonymously if you have the sort of game where you don't want that kind of friction. You can use popular networks like Apple or Google, or you can bring your own identity if you choose. Unity Auth will work with any open ID compliant ID solution out there, and we're working to bring these capabilities to other customer identity solutions throughout the year. So in this example, the player has chosen to create a Unity Player account, which is another aspect of Unity Player Account Services. It's our homegrown identity system that's currently in closed beta. Now what's cool about it is it's a comprehensive ID system. It supports all the features I just mentioned and allows for persistence of identity across titles for those of you interested in cross-play use cases, shared leaderboards, or VIP systems. So the player creates the account with Google, accepts the terms, gives consent, and boom, they're in the game. So now the, the account is created, our player is in, it's time to update some information. Once a player is logged in, they can change their profile name, they can sign out if they choose, they can access some basic game data like player level from UGS Cloud Save or currencies from UGS Economy. In this case, we see the player update their name right here. They take a look at their coins and their level in Cloud Save and Economy, and then it's time for them to move on. So the player completes a mission, receives an award, and it's now time for our customer service team to help them out. So we're gonna swing over to the Unity dashboard really quick here. This will roll by really quick in front of you, but in summary, player management allows studios to find, view, and manage player records for a given game. It's found in the Live Ops section of the Unity dashboard. On display are all the current capabilities of player management. The ability to view a list of existing players, the ability to search for players by ID, player detail pages that provide an overview with attributes like last login, creation date, profile name, linked ID, the economy tab gives visibility into the player's coin count. The cloud save tab gives vis visibility into the player's level and other data. Very relevant to the customer service use cases are these buttons in the top right here, disabling and deletion. Disabling a player is essentially a ban. You can do it both temporarily or permanently if you choose. You see somebody executing that right now, poor guy. Uh, and then for those cases where a player may request, request deletion of data, um, deletion allows for that. It removes data outright for players that request it. Now, we are very aware in UGS that a lot of customer service tools go outside of this UI, and you might have a custom solution of your own. So all of this data is not only accessible in this UI, but it's also access accessible by API, our CLI, which I'll talk about in a minute. Whatever you need to help accelerate your customer support efforts in a way that's best for your business, we just make the data available to you. So that's player account services. So moving away from the player a little bit here and putting on the engineering lens for those of you on the engineering side here, this is a two-parter on the subject of deployments, uh, both deploying from the editor and the automation of deployment workflows. So deploying from the Unity editor. Those of you currently using our services may know that the way UGS handles content management between environments is it's just a little bit tricky. It's there, but environments sort of live in isolation, which makes promoting, versioning, cloning, auditing, and merging your code between environments pretty manual and, well, potentially error prone, frankly. We at UGS are aware of how risky, risky that can be and have been hard at work to deliver capabilities that make deploying your configurations and assets in line with modern CI CD practices. That is that they're file-based, granular, safe, and focused on iteration. So this is where our deployment package comes in. It's currently in pre-release with cloud code and remote config and is rolling ac out across the rest of UGS through this year. It has some simple goals. We wanna allow developers to iterate and manage configurations in the editor with no switching to the dashboard, which is the current reality. We want the ability to version services with the scripts that consume them. So if you have, let's say, a cloud code script that needs to check a value in a service like remote config, we wanna be able to check these values without decoupling them just because they live between services. The main aspect of this package is the deployment window, which is what you can see here. It shows you every deployable asset in your project. In this view, we see some cloud scripts with some JS and a remote config configuration. The, the idea behind this is we reduce human interaction for deployments and show you in a view a default template that works out of the box so you can consume it. So when you create a cloud code script that you know has an expected format and a reference template, it will show you how it works and reduce errors for you. This is all done in the editor, but I don't need to just tell you about that. Let me show you. So what's on screen right now? We've selected a sample project, a 2D roguelike available on the asset store to set up. There's no relationship in this sample to UGS. We've prepared a Unity package that basically overrides the level generation logic, the full game economy logic, so it can be backed by cloud code and remote config so we can change that logic remotely without cutting a new build. 
Once installation is complete, we install our cloud code package, our remote config package, our deployment package. We're prompted to link our Unity project ID. So we can ensure that we target the correct organization and project. Once complete, we go to our deployment settings, make sure we target the environment we wanna work in. We choose our dev environment because we don't wanna affect our players quite yet. And we can get back to configuring our services. There we go. Selecting dev. And now it's time for configuration. Configuring services, looking very briefly at an example cloud code script. This is basically JavaScript that executes remotely whenever the game requests it. At the top, you can see it calls remote config to return a value that we can now manage with the live service. That's remote config's power in a nutshell. But now we see there is also a file, we have a level generation config here, as well as the economy config. So we're gonna just change a value in the game, the food value that we see here to 99, just so when we update it, we can see evidence of the update in the game. Now we can deploy our configuration. We've set up our project's configuration. Now it lives like every other asset in our project. We open our deployment window, deploy different assets to the live service, and this is done by double clicking. It's super easy. And now we're done. The service is now live in my chosen environment and is now up to date. We can simply run the game at this point. So what was formerly a strictly standalone build is now leveraging live services. So we can update the values in our config, food or whatever, without, what it, however we want without cutting a new build. Anybody that's iterated a difficulty curve of our economy will see this as very familiar. And as we can see, the values we didn't touch haven't changed, but food is at 99, which has been changed via the live service. This is all done in the editor as we would have done with any other kind of scripting logic. So that's only a part of the puzzle, isn't it? I promised safe releases with limited human interaction and that was still a lot of human interaction. So we've updated the feature, we're comfortable with how it works. Now we wanna push it to staging for our QA team and we wanna do it safely. So how do we do that? Automating deployments with UGS. So we have a couple goals uh, when it comes to automating deployments, but simply put, it's moving, we wanna make moving configurations between environments and projects automated, easy, and safe for you. To understand our philosophy on automating deployments, let's discuss the anatomy of automation really quickly. It starts with a job that you trigger manually or on a schedule. Then we define some inputs. The first is the repo where the assets live, and the second is the target, what environment you wanna push it to. For the job to execute, we start by checking out and selecting the target branch, specifying versions, changes in master, whatever you prefer. The job will then look for deployable assets like our remote configured script from the previous demo. Then it pushes the configuration to the target environment. So how are we going to do all that, you might wonder. We're going to use the UGS CLI, another release currently in open beta that's fully supported by cloud code and remote config, and again, rolling out across the rest of UGS for the remainder of the year. So let's take a look about how we would do that, starting with source control setup. We're starting from the same project we were just in. We've finished development, committed our changes, and all our files are in our GitHub repo. You can see that we have the same uh, generation config file as when we were working in Unity with the same values. And there it is with the 99 food. So now that we've set it up, we wanna create our CI CD workflow. Our sample is in GitHub, but this works with whatever version control you, you wanna choose. We wanna create an automated workflow. We name it UGS deploy. It's a YAML file. And we're gonna start with a pre-made template that'll dwell on briefly. Here we are. So pausing real quick. Let's relate this to the automation flow we discussed earlier. We've named our workflow UGS promotion workflow, asked for an input, the file already lives in the repo so it knows which repo to target, and now the user can define which environments we want to target. Then we go to the job definition, define the server the job runs on, define environment variables. An example of this would be security measures like service authentication keys to ensure that only accounts authorized to push configs for your organization can do it. Then you target the project, link the environment to the input, the job checks out the source, downloads the CLI, and executes the deploy command on the CLI, and we're able to see all the deployable assets in the folder. So now that our workflow is defined, we just need to commit it to our repo and push it to GitHub, which you can see here. 
Great, time to run our workflow. Looking at our dashboard, we see our project currently has no configuration at all, and we wanna change that. There's a list of GitHub actions here, as is our new promotion workflow we just created. It asks which branch we want to target, we choose main branch, and also the target environment, which in this case is staging. We'll trigger it manually for now, but this could also be automated if you wanted to. All our options are in place, and here's the job in fast forward a bit, so you can see the action executing, code checkout, CLI download, and asset deployment to the live service. All automated, safe, controlled, with limited chance of human error, as I promised you. So now that the job is done running, the only thing we have left to do is validate our environment's content. We know our job's complete. We return to the dashboard. We validate that the service config files have uploaded successfully for both remote config and cloud code. And we see both services are up and running successfully in a new environment. And there you go. We've just set up an automated deployment workflow for multiple UGS services, hooray for me and for you. Of note, I just covered a very broad set of technical capabilities here. I encourage those of you looking to learn more about this subject in particular that you attend our Configuring Gaming Services directly through the Unity Editor in Booth session where all of these concepts will be covered more deeply. And that's Booth S327 if you're wondering. So lastly, but certainly not least, in terms of use cases, is the subject of live bops. A complex and special subject to me as I was a live, op live ops manager for a long time, I'm gonna to talk to you about operating live events with UGS player engagement. So I'm gonna show you how to use UGS to set up a Halloween event that's gonna provide new content to help engage your players. Now, like I said, this is complex. Typically, to do something like this in a live op context, you need a bunch of service capabilities, whether they're Unities or your own, that do analytics, remote configuration, economy, cloud content delivery, game overrides, push notifications. <sighs> it's complex. Player engagement looks to simplify that complexity with its calendar view, which simplifies all of your events, notifications, and content, content into a date-based interface. You can see in this case that we have two ongoing push notifications, an autumn event, a battle pass feature that's running, and we're just gonna pretend that while we're looking at our calendar, we notice that we've got nothing planned for Halloween at all, which is a problem. That's something we can monetize and get players excited about. So we're gonna set up a game override for our Halloween 2023 event. A game override is our terminology for the logic of updating game content. So let's set the schedule first. We're gonna run it, let's say, from the Monday before Halloween at a, at a specific start time. Let's see if we can get this done, there we are. And then we're gonna run it until say the Sunday after at a specific end time. Give our players a nice long event to, to, to be excited about. And we've created our override. Now that doesn't do anything by itself other than set a time interval, so we need to set up the override. Setting up a game override kind of segments into three areas, targeting, content, and scheduling. Targeting, which is what we'll choose first, is how we select our audience. That is the players eligible for the event. We can target the entire audience if we want or roll it out progressively to a specific percentage, as you can see. We've selected the entire audience in this case, but this could be configured to be target customer or country or platform, player level, monetizer or not, whatever you want. Now that we've configured our audience, it's time to set our content rules. Now this is where player engagement gets really great because it combines a bunch of just different services into a single interface. In content, we're going to update event configuration with remote config. We're gonna target our Halloween specific game assets with cloud content delivery. And we're gonna update a virtual purchase with the economy service. So getting into remote config first, this is our event config. We're gonna control whether the event hub that promotes the event shows up in the game or not. We're gonna de declare in the config whether we wanna show discounts to players during the event or not and we're going to establish how many people we want to participate in the event. This is just an example, but any value that you want to configure in this way could be put in remote config to test. Then we're gonna to move to CCD and set up a Halloween bucket where all the spooky in-game assets we want to have show up in the game live and point it to production to trigger at the timing of the event. Then we go into economy and we're going to change our biggest pack, reduce its price in terms of number of coins from 2,000 to 1,600 in hopes of enticing players to buy the item while participating in the event. 
So one thing I want to mention here, even though we're not demoing it, is A-B testing. All of these changes can be selected as variables in an A-B test. You can test whatever you want that's associated with the override. We're not going to do that in this uh, example. We're going to stick with one variation, but as you can see, you can select variables and run a test against it. So our schedule has been pulled through from the calendar. We're giving it a high priority, so we make sure that all of our players experience in advance of our overrides. We click Finish, do a quick review of what our override looks like, if it looks like how we want it to look. Then we hit Enable. Now, once it's enabled, this means when Halloween arrives, our players will automatically pull this new content when the event starts from all the relevant services, just like that. So that's not the end of the live ops cadence, though. You also probably want to know how the event's performing when it starts running. And that's where our analytics product comes in. As soon as players start participating in the event, that will generate analytics events, which then let us see how our game or our event is performing through Unity Analytics. We can analyze it at the top level or go further in the data explorer and select a number of different cohorts or metrics to see our impact across the player experience as a whole. It's got all the stuff, the ARP DAOs and the revenue metrics, the retention metrics, the active user metrics, anything you might want to be looking at when trying to assess the performance of a given game or event. So, that concludes our demonstration today, not just for live ops, but for all the use cases I have to show you. Hopefully this gives you a better understanding of how Unity Gaming Services comes together to make operating your live game easier. So, how do you learn more about it? Obviously, we have all of this information and product details on our dashboard at dashboardunity.com. Each one of these use cases either has an in-booth session or a representative on the floor that could answer more questions about it. I'm also gonna be available on the sidebar for anybody that wants to talk about these capabilities in detail. I encourage you to attend the deep dives that are in our in-booth sessions and come say hi to me either here or on the floor if I happen to see you. So. With that, I want to give you thanks. Thank you for hearing me out today, learning more about our services, and I wish you a happy and lovely GDC. Thank you. Thank you.